So this uh, blockchain isn't my specialty in any way. I've been, for the last 15 years, working in cooperative, uh, cooperative programs. I've done things from biodiesel to production of beans and red fruit and whatever we could really come up with for years. We were trying really hard to build a team. So what I'm going to talk about today is mostly about the the part our team and the part where we connect uh, our team with the bigger the bigger world in general. And I've been asked to speak a little bit about what we've done to bring energy back into the compo, into the rural the rural communities of the world. Uh, right now, about 54% of the world lives in cities. So we're piling into the cities, and you can feel it here in Costa Rica. In the last 10 years, I think a million cars have been added to the mix here. You can feel it every time you drive around here. So I'm not opposed to living in cities. I personally have been out in the jungle for the last, what, 13 years, and I've enjoyed that a lot. Puriscal, uh, we moved to uh, a spot just outside of Puriscal, between Puriscal and Parita, on the Rio Tulin. And what we did was we bought, uh, we bought eight hectares of destroyed like cattle land, where people had had pigs and cattle for maybe 40 or 50 years. So it was really denuded, cut down. And all the whole Puriscal region is really, has been clear cut about 60 or 70 years ago. So I got out here and uh, with a group of about 10 friends in 2006, we started a collective called Verde Energia Pacifica. And that's again in, in Bajulanas, a little town outside of Puriscal. And our drive there really was to see what we could pull off uh, as a small group. I was, I was really engaged in activism, really wanted to see the world change, was trying to change it politically, but ran into a lot of roadblocks. Uh, mostly that I didn't have any power and I didn't have a team. So what I started doing with my friends and family was developing a real plan from the bottom up, how we could do things from uh, protecting our community, producing food, producing medicine, building materials, everything we needed for our lives that was possible to localize. So uh, before I left the States, one of the things that really motivated me, one of the ways I saw change coming, was through a thing called CSAs, which is called Community Supported Agriculture. And I think that's one of the spots uh, in the US that's a glowing light. Localizing food production has been a big part of, of uh, bottom-up organizing. And so Verde Energia started with about 15 of us total in the beginning. Now there's about 80 of us. Maybe in our total collective, maybe 150 people that are socios with us. Um, and what motivated me to get there was to see what is possible. I need to slow down. Too much coffee. <laughs> see what's possible with your friends and family. Costa Rica is a good example of a country that will try to bring about environmental positive change. We're trying to protect the land here as a collective. I work with MAG and I work with the different co-ops and Copia Puriscal and Copia Tennis. And there's a, a lot of drive to do good from the bottom up here. And the government seems to be helping us. So what, what I found is I, I like that we're doing that. Costa Rica is about 27% protected so far. Um, about 10% national parks and about 17% cooperative joint ventures with farmers through ISE and through MAG and COVID to get trees in the ground. And that's a good start, but I, I personally don't want to have to see the governments of the world do this. I want to see us do this more. We've been speaking a lot about teamwork and about doing things ourselves. And uh, what we've done in our little, our little piece of heaven there, right down here, is in a few years we've learned how to reforest with like using nature. We have permaculture coming to our lives and a lot of really amazing earth scientists, a lot of really amazing teachers have poured through my farm. We've had about 5,000 people come through in 12 years, 13 years. And that really motivated me because I had given up on people. I, I thought people were kind of, I wanted to go live in the jungle alone with about 10 of my friends. So what, what I found out there is there's a lot of beautiful solutions in the challenges. And the challenges we have in this country are not much different than any other place. We need to protect our land, we need to protect our water. We need to at the same time create an economy. And there's a lot of great projects out there, a lot of great permaculture projects, a lot of great uh, donation-based uh, initiatives. And that's, that's beautiful. But I, what I found is that it was taking just people that had a ton of love for this to make that happen. And I wanted to figure out how we could do something like this, how we could bring about regeneration through actual just like economics. I want to see what we could do to make it profitable to do good things. So in the, in the background of our farms, we saw reforestation was happening. We did about half the work, and the birds and the monkeys and the squirrels did the rest. The squirrels also eat all my cacao. I don't like that. But we're, we're in a, we, found, we found a balance over the years to where nature could help us do these things, and we were grooving with what nature could, uh, what nature could, uh, could do better than us, could regenerate the soils, could stop erosion, could encapsulate water. One tree 
One full-size jungle tree here has maybe 200,000 liters of water stored in it. So a lot of my friends, a lot of, a lot of people from the first world were trying really hard to figure out high-tech solutions for everything. But I found some really low-tech, eloquent solutions in trees and in the right plants. And what many people might call, I don't know, permaculture is a little messy. It's not just like rows of corn. It's, we've mixed things up. We have cacao trees with, with nuts growing underneath them, with, with turmeric growing on the ground, and ginger. There's vines climbing up the trees with high-protein nuts. And um, You guys are doing that at your farm, too. Really learning how to get on the ground and how to create local solutions to big problems. So what I, what I realized being out there was a lot of my ideals as an activist were coming from kind of my first world perspective, and I hadn't really gotten down and dirty in the, the work that had to be done on the ground. So moving to the combo and put a scout to an area that's really economically depressed and hasn't really had any, everybody's leaving. We've had a huge problem with urbanization and brain drain in the combo. I think 80% of Costa Ricans now live in the city. So there's really, it's a real dwindling culture. And where we chose to live, we're off the bus routes, we're, we're kind of hidden. And there was, uh, there was nothing to do. Everybody's leaving. All the kids are leaving. The schools are closing. And they don't want to leave. A lot of my neighbors want to be where they've been. They want their families uh, to stay where they've lived for the last 100 years. And so what I started to do was really communicate with my neighbors and figure out what needed to happen. Something that everyone could do. Not just a group of gringos coming in here with money, but what could someone do? What could my neighbor do too? So I, I listened. I stopped talking for a couple years. I didn't know Spanish when I got here, that helped. And, uh, and what I found was that we were really missing with some of the big tools that it took to get over the hump, to go from being uh, a country who uses the most chemicals per hectare in the world. We use 18.2 kilograms of like Monsanto products, herbicides per, per hectare where I live. And my neighbors used to live to be 100 years, and they're dying of cancer at 45 now. It's not an abstract problem where I live. Our water is toxic. Um, our, and our roads are sliding away, erosion is a problem. Like we've seen the results now of really bad ideas, whether it be the tobacco industry, overproduction of food on steep hills or cattle, and now what's happening is palm oil is racing up the hills towards our community. And we're having really, we're having not just monoculture of plants, but we're having a monoculture of culture because all the cities, all the little towns, they evacuate and all you end up with is a few employees for a Fortune 500 company. Now, I don't want to just complain about this stuff, we cut two football fields of forest every second, every day. Last year, the world lost a forest the size of New Zealand, and the year before that, and the year before that, and next year. At current rates, if we don't decide to do something, we're not going to have forests. We're going to have lots of trees planted around the world, but they're very sparse, and there's not a lot of contiguous forests. There's not a lot of animal uh, habitat, a lot of wildlife habitat that's missing. And I'm not, I'm not here just to say I want to. I have a bleeding heart for everything that I love, which I do. I love the oceans, I love a healthy ecosystem. But I'm also here because we've tried to figure out ways that are real solutions, things that people can do, that anybody can do, not just the wealthy, and not just, uh, not just the Fortune 500. So what I found early on is we were lacking some of the biggest problems were, how do, how do my neighbors get products to market? How do we get investment into the combo? How do we get the education needed into the combo? How do we educate the cities about how to utilize and co-op with their neighbors in the, in the rural areas. So what we found, as most farms that have been doing what I've been doing, permaculture, the, a lot of, there's hundreds of permaculture farms in Costa Rica, is that you run into a roadblock when it comes to processing things, when it comes to getting things to market, packaged, getting all the legal stuff done to get to market, uh, exporting, lawyers, uh, legal accountants, bankers, all this stuff. The blockchain is, is, is hopefully, and will continue to do, will make it easier for us. But what, these are real problems right now. And I, I, for years, we've been trying to come up with bottom-up solutions. And when it gets to banking and legal, these have been roadblocks, big roadblocks. So we started, Verde Energia wasn't enough. We were a small farm collective, but we couldn't answer some of these bigger questions. I didn't have access to the kind of money it takes uh, from our small farm perspective. So a few years ago, uh, above our farm, which was a beautiful little oasis now of, of jungle, uh, it looks like it's been there for 50 years. It's 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it was cattle land. So seeing this grow gave me a deep, deep respect and hope in nature. And I did not have a lot of hope when I moved here. Uh, so I, I, found, I found the trees taught me a powerful lesson about the slow growth and the getting out of the way and letting nature do its job and enabling it a bit. But, 
but learning from it instead of trying to push it around. So what we did is we started a new collective. We had a palm oil interest come in and they were gonna buy the farm above us. And that was, they were gonna clear cut and destroy all five of our water sources at our farm they're gonna have. And that was unacceptable. I didn't know what to do. We don't have a lot of money in our collective. We were just 40, 50 middle, lower class kids trying to make this thing work. So we had to come up with a new solution. So my team over there at Black Sheep, we, we started figuring out how we could organize this better. We needed to have a, uh, like a system solution, not just, a, just racing to stop bad things from happening to our farm. And real quick about that point, I realized that permaculture, what I'd been learning, was way too little boat. A lot of people doing what I do are thinking they're gonna produce all their food, they're gonna produce everything they need on their farm. That's not realistic. You need things from all over the world, and other people need things from here. That's gonna keep happening. I'm not an anti-globalist, I just want, I want intelligent justice in the supply chain, and we can have a global society. So Black Sheep came into existence to try and marry some of the things that we couldn't do, and a lot of the things that many smart, small farms are never gonna pull off, which is putting together a million dollars cash to build a facility for processing food, stabilizing food. It sounds like a great idea just to switch over to organic agriculture. It sounds like it may just be a decision, but there's actually, there's a deep, it's a loss, there's a deep loss. We've, we've lost our topsoil. People may be concerned about peak oil or peak water. Peak topsoil is something we're not talking about. And what I learned in Bajo Lanas and Puriscal was that that stuff can be done, we can fix it, but it's gonna take a minute. It's gonna take many years in some places to recover the soil to a point where we can even produce or we can have water again and aquifers filling up and being there available for us and our children. So what Black Sheep has done is we've coordinated and done some of the bigger work that any one farm could do, those legal things, spending two years with accountants and quantifying what it means to make soil useful again. And this, this was actually very difficult. Regen Network's been on this too. Um, Chemical agriculture is not easier. It's, it's really, when we use these, these chemicals, they come from petrol, petrochemical, agri, agri, what am I saying? Yeah, anyway. When we use petrochemicals to grow things on our farms, what we're doing is we're kind of stealing from the future. First, and, and we're choosing not to just rebuild what we've done in the past. So in a, in a barrel of oil, of which the earth uses, the, the world uses about 75 million barrels a day, each one of those barrels holds about 11 years of your labor in it. So there's a, very, there's a serious thing happening there. It's not just we want to change. We have to change for a lot of reasons. We're subsidizing the lack of soil. We're subsidizing the lack of water through a lot of really bad ideas. And at Verde Energia, we tried, we tried really hard to just get into producing everything we could. What we found is that we could produce a little bit here, a little bit there, but how do you get through, and not just me, but how does my neighbor who has no money to risk who feeds their family month to month, a campesino here in Puriscal, how do they get into this game? How do they do organics without going broke or having to sell their family farm? And I, I, couldn't, find, I couldn't find a way for that. I, it's very hard. I, I didn't come here to lecture people about being organic. I came here to learn. And I learned that there's, there's, a, there's a period. We have to help. We in the cities, we need to recognize how vital it is to have wild spaces, how vital it is to have have agricultural people in your country, have farms. We're importing more and more every day in Costa Rica. I think, I think maybe 10% of people in Costa Rica now live or work in agriculture. So we're kind of giving up our food sovereignty. <clears throat> yeah, so Black Sheep, Black Sheep came into existence to make sure that we could help the people that want to work with us get over the hump of transitioning to organic regenerative agriculture or to just decide maybe that certain areas need to be left for birds, certain areas need to be left for, for, for wildlife and not just for cattle. And Puriscal cattle is our biggest challenge right now. I don't know if any of you have driven through there, but it's, when it's not the rainy season, it's brown, it's grass everywhere. So we're watching our heroes of road. And so from the, from the combo, it's not just that we, need to have, we have to learn new techniques. We, need, we vitally need access to investment, which doesn't just mean we need people to come put money into our projects. We need to learn how to even know what to ask for. I've spent the last year working in legal, working in to, to work on things like getting blockchain, getting prepared for blockchain, and 
we're doing equity tokens, hopefully, we're going to do one day. But in learning all this, what we've really seen is that most of us, most of our small businesses aren't even prepared. We aren't anywhere close to ready for even take in capital. There's a, there's a lot to it. And access to markets. I can grow all the tomatoes I want, but if I didn't develop markets, what do I do with those tomatoes? So there's a lot of top-down solutions that have like that aren't really answering the questions. So in the transition to regenerative, uh, regenerative production, I've seen that it takes about three to five years for a farm to start, for a farm or a, a lumber lot or a, a cattle farm for anybody to start transitioning. It takes some real energy. It takes some real money. So what we've been doing is we've been developing ways that we can take investment in. We've been doing SEC, we're in the middle of an SEC filing right now. I've been talking a lot about the Securities Exchange Commission, but it's, it's, we're setting ourselves up so that we can take in like venture capital now. But this wasn't something we envisioned. I really wanted to do this bottom up. Well, it's a lot bigger job than I thought. And scaling up is big. And what we need, what all of us need, is we need access to capital to get our jobs done. We need access to the experts the legal, the regulatory bodies, all these things coming together is, is something that I think blockchain can really help us with. I don't know uh, our, person, our company, I'm not sure yet what the path is because there's some regulatory issues. We don't know if we're gonna have an equity token, we don't know if we're gonna be a security token one day, we're not sure. But we're here to reach out and find the talent we need. I've been in Costa Rica for 13, 14 years now and uh, the energy in, in Costa Rica for organics, the energy in Costa Rica for this bottom-up approach, and you all sit in this room, this, this has been giving me the hope I need to scale this all up. We, I was supposed to cut a little short, so I don't know where I'm at. A couple minutes? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I wanted to talk to you guys, I wanted you guys to ask a few questions, so I was gonna cut it short and just ask, see if anybody had any questions about what we're doing. I have Black Sheep or a Verdana here. I was going to do this for about 10 minutes, but we don't have much time. So, Does anybody have any questions about what we're doing? Preguntas? Questions? Tienen preguntas para that? No. Okay. So, anyway. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, so, how is Black Sheep related to blockchain? Okay, so Black, Black Sheep has been developing the access to markets, investors, through the legal structures, and it's an umbrella that lets all these other farms have access to this. So Black Sheep is either a full owner or a partial partner in each one of the projects we do. Black Sheep is doing all the stuff it takes to get investors to protect the farms from investors. One thing that was really sensitive in the beginning as we did this is that we were taking really personal, like your farm, it's, it's, your, it's your baby, right? Taking Verde and then and like opening up to more people, opening up to people with big money. It was really, I didn't want to do it. So we created another organization that could, that could be the, the pathway for this. So that our, the individual farms are never gonna be lost in the mix. We're a collective of collective farms. So Black Black Sheep is like an umbrella and it's helping get organic certifications for each farm. It's helping access monies, helping deal with the tariffs, the taxes, the, all the legal stuff it takes to employ people here. So that's why Black Sheep exists. And Black Sheep will probably have a thousand partners by the time we're done. Right now we have three farms that are in our network, and we're developing two or three different companies in the U.S. for doing distribution um, or regenerative products. We're developing uh, in Coyo, we're developing a processing facility that can handle millions of kilos a year of, of food, medicine, process plants for people for small farms. So Black Sheep is kind of the hub of collective production. Yeah, and then we do profit sharing to keep make sure that as we make money and things are, things succeed, that all the way down to the farmer level gets, gets to partake in that, share the wealth. And so far we have about 100, like I said, 150 to 200 uh, owners of our companies around the world. So I think soon we'll probably have five to 600 because we're just about to open up for investment. Any other questions? No. So how does Black Sheep combine saving the forest and making this a more sustainable world with uh, making profits as an investment. So as we were as we were doing reforestation, there became quite obvious that there were a lot of like byproducts of doing the right works of doing good work. So going out and setting up and building a forest, in certain areas we have level lands, most of our areas are pretty steep. 
So on the steeper areas, we just turn that over to nature. But on the areas that have some flat lands or something accessible or really high quality soils, we mix in. So we'll be growing a, a tree for reforestation and under that in its shade is a cacao tree and under the cacao tree in its shade is turmeric. So by value adding those products, not just being a, a farm that sells things to the world market, but value adding the turmeric, value of making, we make oleo, oleo resins, we extract the essential oils from turmeric. And so we, we value that in certain areas that lets us that lets the, the forest come back like in its wake. So we on a on a hectare of land, we might mix in three or four hundred trees that would be good for building materials, like mobile building materials. And under that we might mix in fifty thousand kilos of tumor. And in between those are cacao trees where we get several thousand kilos of cacao a year. And maybe five to ten percent of a project. Uh, can be high enough, can have high enough production to turn the rest of it into wildlife corridors, uh, protection of water communities, and creating jobs because there's something in where I live is there's just no opportunity in Babolanes. So it's been a very big part of my mission is making sure that what we do, at least people have choice. I'm not, I'm not here to tell people what to do, but I want my neighbors to have choices. So we've, we've done it in a way that allows us to make a great return on investment without uh, in the past, we did like a donation-based model at Red Energia, but what we've done now is working. It works economically between the school we run, the the, the students that come through, and the agriculture. Uh, I, I can hand you guys. Anybody wants to see it, we'll give you our, our pro formas and stuff. So it, it's really great. And what we've been doing is developing a system that that other people can duplicate. So what we're doing as as it's done, we're going to have a lot of joint ventures. A lot of people. Uh, we're open sourcing all this stuff. So. But there's a lot of money in the mountains. The, the warehouse, I don't know if you guys know the names, but Warehouse or Georgia Pacific, the biggest forestry companies in the United States, they're very profitable. It's, it's, it's not a, a loss. Like we, we've kind of given up forests to a couple big companies like we do most of our industry. But, uh, but this is something we can participate in. And down here, it is a little tougher to do business. Uh, the government's been a little, it slows things down. But they also are helping us. So we have we have small small participatory government officials in our area that are great. I love Ministry of Agriculture. Um, it's been it's been a, it's been a learning curve, but we're uh, we're there. And it looks like from a you can probably get about 40 times return on your money if you do agroforestry right. So we're we're not doing this just for the love. In the beginning it was, but the byproducts have proven to us that there's enough economy in this to make it work for everybody. All right, we have the last question here, and then we'll go over to the next council. Oh, sorry. Okay, some question over there. Okay. Um, love what you're doing. Uh, question about, can, can you tell us a little bit more about your fundraising story? Um, you mentioned that uh, you were looking to do a, um, an equity-backed ICO. Can you, can you talk about maybe some of your uh, challenges that you came up, came up against when you, when you were doing that? Just, you know, because I'm doing something similar, actually, and I would love to know, you know, what, what were some of the challenges you faced, um, and maybe a little bit about the decision making behind the equity back. Well, as we set up to do that, about a year and a half ago, we started making a plan for for tokenizing. We realized how much work there really was in just becoming a public company or becoming a company that took investors. So, uh, what we've really done is at our project so far, we've got a very deep proof of concept on the nature end, what we can do really well with the ground, what we can do really well with the soil. The production part, we've, we've got our proof of concept there. On the, the crypto end, we're, we're, we're sort of in a research and development mode on that right now because I don't want to end up in jail. Uh, <laughs> and I don't want any of my friends to break the law. And I'm, I may be like an anarchist pervy on the ground, but I'm also a socialist deep down and I want my community to thrive. And I want to pay taxes, and I want to do the things that we've been speaking about today. Is be in, in, I want regulation because I, being a student of history, I've seen what's happened so far in the world. Whenever there, when there's no rules around stuff, people go. People go as far as they can, and I, uh, I want to be a part of creating the right, the right strategy. So we're hoping that the, the equity exchanges are up and running and everything's legal in the next year or two so that we can tokenize what we'll probably do if we can we'll be tokenize a fund we'll do a forestry fund separate of our, our primary business so we don't risk all of this right now on that on that uh, venture but but we hope to tokenize big agroforestry projects and 
uh, probably two to three years. About the same time that we would be developing uh, an IPO. We could, with what we're doing now, we could go do public, or we could go become a public company in a few years anyway. But I'd love, I'd love to make this work out in the crypto space. Now, blockchain for me is much more exciting uh, for the farm and the, co the cooperative uh, as a, a way of tracking inventory, sales, uh, and all, all the stuff we need to track in a normal business, accounting. That's where we're, in, we're implementing and re researching blockchain, blockchain now. I said blockchain, sorry, blockchain chain. But uh, yeah, so right now it's really, it's really more internal tools. But I, I really, we really want to, in the next two years, take what we've done and tokenize it. Probably the equity token world, but we'll see. Yeah. All right.